I'm a minister. I am in a relationship with a lady that may be a witch. Uh-uh. That is the interpretation of that presentation in tongues. <laughs> so a minister is dating a witch. Okay, go on. <laughs> so we are not going to ask how he came about that knowledge. Because that will take us to Unibend. I feel, I feel stuck because she doesn't flame my Christian tendency. Hmm. Breaking up is hard. What do I do? Give your wife the mic. She's the expert on all this. <laughs> Give her the mic. Give her the mic. That's her own calling. She, she has a... Most of the iconic um, relationship responses I've, I've had in my short window on Facebook came from you. So, go on. my God, praise God. Thank you very much, Papa, yeah. for the opportunity. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is very difficult now. I'm standing in front of my father. Somewhere that dissects scriptures. What do you want to say? Praise <laughs> God. All right. Um, now, the first thing is you know. How you know, I don't know. <laughs> but like Papa said, we don't want to go there, right? So let me, let me come from your question. Because if I have to have a one-on-one -on -one with you, I want to say, how do you know? But now, since you know, because you didn't say, I don't, you're not confused. It's very sure, you are sure that you know. Now, my people perish for lack of knowledge, so you know. Mm. So that's a beautiful one. Now, um, that you know, and that you cannot, you're finding it hard to break up since you already know. It means that, um, it means, praise it, God. It means there might be a generational cost there. <laughs> Because if you say, I mean, if you said, you don't, you're finding it hard to break up and you know, my people perish for lack of knowledge, but you, you know, your problem is not absence of knowledge. Your problem is that you now have fullness of knowledge, but you decide to perish. Of course. <laughs> I didn't want to say that because they will say, my own they had, my own they had. So. No, I, they, there is a, they, the person is in league with Satan to corrupt his destiny. He's, he has been looking for Satan to align with him. So even though he knows that, he said, it is hard to... <laughs> May the Lord help us. <laughs> yes, Pastor? Sir, I discovered that my local pastor has affairs with ladies in the church. Okay. It's a discovery. <laughs> yes. Aimasoke Kamolo. That's the version of that in tongues. Some things we need to also say the, the tongue aspect to educate the angels around. <laughs> so he discovered, he made it his discovery. Okay. Go Be on. Because two of them, I know so much to me them. about their experiences. So two of the victims are people that he knows. How exactly do I handle this? Uh, no, you don't, you, it's not in your place to handle it. But it, it's in your place to exit. Uh, you don't have the authority, the requisite authority to handle it. But you can exit. According to the scriptures, a preacher that is a victim of an immoral lifestyle has lost his ticket to the pulpit. He should stay away from the pulpit because ministry is like transmission. Ministry is like transmission. Um, how many of you know Theophilus Sunday, my friend? Theophilus Sunday is an intercessor. Now, when he comes to the pulpit, he, he will begin to sing something like a song. But the impact of the song he's singing is, is not singing. The impact is that the people will begin to pray. Because what he is releasing into the congregation is the spirit of supplication. Not a, a, a song. Do you understand that? Now, that's how we know what is being ministered. A minister can be speaking English, quoting John chapter 4, but what he's transmitting into the congregation is the wisdom 
and the spirit of, of immorality. You will come out of the church and the wisdom to talk to pregnant women. You just have it. That my own, what I like, is, they are not women. The ones that are pregnant are heavy. You will know that. Well, may the Lord give you understanding. So you cannot handle the situation, but you can leave the arena of that transmission. May the Lord give you understanding. And if there's any minister that mistakenly is overtaken by an immoral situation, you discipline yourself by staying away from the pulpit. Let it be your own personal decision. Don't tell anybody, oh, but leave the pulpit for six months and then allow other pastors to be ministering while you are sorting yourself with God. Even if, are you there? Don't tell your members, but leave the pulpit. If you know you have a senior person that you can confide in that will not use it as a weapon against you, go to that person. Because if the person doesn't have the maturity to handle the situation, Satan will operate through the person. And so you can open up the situation to people that are mature enough to handle it. And the person will join you in prayer and defend you. And when the time comes for you to be restored back to ministry, the person can come to you, with you, to the altar, minister for you as a sign that only you and him know that you are restored. A man that is caught up in sexual sin will have to be restored back to ministry. A lot of people believe that you can hide it, cover up, and intimidate the people that have discovered. You are, you don't, you are not in ministry. You are transmitting immorality. As, as an assignment. I've been in the body of Christ for a while and I found out that younger ministers, when they fall into immorality, they are so stubborn, they don't want to follow protocol. Whenever I see that, I dissociate with you quickly. If I give you an opportunity for redemption and you believe that there's something beyond redemption, you will use your life as a specimen. When calabash falls and breaks, it is still useful. They use it to pack debt. So if a minister falls, it's still useful. We will use you as an example to teach others what happens to a man that falls. So whether you are restored or whether you remain in falling state, you are useful to the body of Christ. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Stay away from pulpit. You see, he has poster. Where his hand is? It's like, it's like this. And he thinks he's trying to save his ministry. He doesn't know he has lost his license. The status of his heart has been revealed. He's a performer. An entertainer. He's in circus. He's not a minister. He doesn't know the Lord. Now we need to bring all that back to the body of Christ so that we can have authentic, credible ministries. Yes, that we can depend on for the deliverance of our nation. That's where we are. So we can no longer hide the figures. We can no longer hide the truth. We have to come to the platform and say the truth so that Facebook can help us. That's how the renewal will begin to take place. In, somebody is saying in the congregation, he say, huh, what if you fall? You will wait for the last trump before I fall. The last trumpet. Yes. Last trump. I know the grace that keeps a man from falling. That was my first line of research when I knew I had the calling to be a preacher. Sin is like pregnancy. It follows a gestation period. The gestation period of, of an elephant is 365 days. That means in 365 days, you will not see what is making the stomach big. So God gives you time to repent. When fornication is building in your heart, it has a gestation period. Are you, are you there? <laughs> Enough for you to commit an abortion. You don't, it, it, it won't just come and, Hey, I fell. If, if that's how it happens, people will be falling in the market and in the public places. <laughs> Nobody has ever fallen at Ring Road. See? At Ring Road? No. It means he has some control. He, he chooses the place and prays about the thing before it happens. Yes. So there's a gestation period. The lust has entered your heart. And lust cannot be on your heart and you will not know. Before the lust now grows to a point where it produces sin, you have the opportunity to abort. So I know what I'm talking about. If you are waiting for me, you will wait till the last trump. Are you there? 
Yes. Thank you, sir. Sir, how can a pastor move his congregation beyond 20 attenders? 20 church attendance? growth. Church growth. Let me give you this, the principle of growth. Huh? Principle of growth that I learned from the Bible. That principle is called prayer. And they continued steadfastly the apostles' doctrine, breaking up prayer, in prayer. Then in the book of Acts chapter 6, he said, when the numbers of the disciples did what? Multiply. How many years of prayer have you invested that you want growth? The prayer you are praying will change you first. It will kill your ambition, kill everything, and then rejuvenate the vision of the Lord Jesus on your heart first. The prayer you are praying will kill fornication, desires to touch, touch woman's breast. All those desires are there. And you want growth so that there will be more customers for breast? <laughs> yes. So the prayers will change you first before it begins to change the work. In fact, the reason why God gives you the work is so that he can change you. You are a hardened man. So he gives you something that you cannot influence except he's with you. So mm, that's how he can put you in prison and accept and, 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 and change you. So it will take time. In my own experiment, my own practice, my own model, it took us 14 years of desperate intercession to experience a breakthrough. But you say you don't like figures, that it discourages people. So it is withdrawn. That one is withdrawn. 14 years, yes. During the course of these 14 years, some of the disciples I was raising felt I was not going anywhere. Because they felt that I could make myself blow, and I didn't want to make myself blow. It means I couldn't handle greatness. I was doing miracles, but there was no growth. I'd raised a few crippled people. There was no growth. I could pick things. There was no growth. So, so based on their estimation, and they felt 14 years was too long. How long are we going to wait? So they left me, and I released them with joy. Uh, that is, they started living from 10, age, when we were doing that thing for 10 years, 10 to 13. Then in the 14th year, we became global. It took three months for the shift to take place. Three months. Now I don't need an invitation to go anywhere. We go to, we do meetings, we sponsor crusades in nations. That's what I'm saying. From here. Yes, from here we sponsor crusades in nations. Conferences. So the meetings that we have scheduled, our own meetings, they are too much that I cannot take invitation. That is what I'm saying. If you are seeing me with my brother here, are you following? It is because he's a man of God. That's why I'm here. Because in order for me to be here, we have to cancel something to accommodate this. So it means that this, this meeting is more significant in the heart of God than the one who I would have gone. You get it? So I don't need... There is no platform on that heaven that is, an, is promotion for me to preach on. Not anymore. Not anymore. The platform that I'll be on is the one God sent me. You might send me an invitation to preach in a meeting to one million people. That is not a guarantee that I will come. I will go and ask God, are you there? And a thousand times I will ask him, are you there? So those of you that believe in our ministry and all of that, I can't come to your individual churches. So if one, I come to one person, let all of you come. So that we can receive an update. That's the only way I can manage it at this level. It took us 14 years for the breakthrough that you speak about. 14 years of holiness. 14 years of prayer. And a time will come where the number of the disciples will multiply. We have been to nations. And as we are arriving, our disciples there will gather. In thousands. So they are the ones that we do the meetings. Set up things. So we don't need an invitation. If we say, we are coming to Angola, and we put it on Facebook, we are coming to Angola, uh, we will have workforce and people that will do something like this. And all the money. So it happened in three months. 
So stay. Stay in the prayer. Stay. It produces results. Prayer guarantees spread. And I can tell you. So anywhere we go, we must start a prayer tower, a prayer hub. People have to run the team for four years first. Then their heart will be ready to be discipled. Then we we'll begin to teach them kingdom principles. And before you know it, you will see giants will rise that Satan cannot defeat. Okay? Go back to your prayer floor. It might be dusty with dust because you have not been visiting there. Dust it and say, I die here. And I assure you, you will not die. Yeah? Everybody that said, if I die, I die. In the Bible, did not die. The one that said, if, if God were to open the window of heaven, shall these things be? He died in the evening. May the Lord help us. My question goes like this. How, as a minister, do you handle a situation whereby you are pastoring in a zone that you know is witchcraft zone? And how do you handle it so that when you are dealing with issues, your family and those you are leading will be protected from their onslaught? Because I discovered that most times you're doing something in the kingdom and you're taking grounds, but the attack goes back to the people you are leading. So how do you handle it? Then secondly, as a minister, sometimes to spend hours in prayers becomes a bit difficult. Sometimes today you do like four hours, discover that because of your busy schedule, business and other activities, you struggle to keep the tempo. How does one maintain a, an ascending and effective prayer? Life. Okay. If you are pastoring in a location that is spiritually sensitive because of the density of demonic activities that are collocated in that location, then you need to pastor differently. And what I mean by that is you need to raise every member of your congregation and indeed every member of your household to be an intercessor. Now, this, this pastoral system where the pastor is prayerful, is aligned with the Lord, and he pastors a bunch of infantiles is a risk. Because the corporate ranking of your congregation is going to be defective. And that is going to make your congregation a center of demonic attraction. There is corporate faith. There is corporate prayer, there is corporate anointing, and there is corporate rank. A congregation may not have the authority to do some things in a territory because it doesn't have the requisite corporate ranking to carry out that activity. Raise every member of your congregation to be an intercessor. My daughter, I think she's 10 years old, she can pray in tongues for two hours. Yes, that's my daughter. So when you come to my house, there are two, two times a day where we have hour of prayer. Whether you are a visitor, you are already implicated and you'll be afflicted by prayer before you leave. You must contribute. And that's how we as pastors in the ministry have a prayer regiment. The congregation is a praying congregation. So if Satan needs to plan where to attack, he needs to plan, he needs to sit down and say, so you make everyone an intercessor. It will be easy for you to advance without noticing that there's feedback. There will be feedback, but you will not notice it. And secondly, on the issue of being consistent in prayer. Most times, we dichotomize the sacred from the secular. We say, now I'm going to work and I work in the bank. So you do bank things, and when you come out of the bank, you now say, oh, I'm born again. So we need to pray. As long as you are operating with that perspective, you are going to be deficient in your daily contribution in terms of uh, spiritual exercise. So the moment you realize that your secular life and your sacred life is one and the same thing, then you look for ways by which you can build your spiritual engagement into your daily proceedings. I worked in the oil industry for 16 years and my job was both mentally tasking and um, physically tasking. 
It is because of that kind of job that people take courses in mathematics in the university. So it's mentally tasking, it is physically tasking. Physically tasking, uh, I think you have a depot in Benin. Now, the volume is too loud. Can you reduce it, please? Because I, I might shout at some point. You have a depot in Benin. Your depots and your tanks in the depots are not tall. I can run to the top of your depots in Benin. But when you go to satellite in Lagos, that's where you find the tallest tanks in Nigeria. I walked those tanks for seven years. You can't climb that tank haven't eaten food in the morning. You must fast to climb it. Are you still with me? And if you don't climb it, you cannot take inventory for fiscalization. When you have taken inventory, you need to compromise your readings with what is obtainable in the calibration chart. And that's the mat mathematical aspect. So there's mathematics, there is climbing. And I was doing all of this, and there is offshore engagement. When vessels come, we go to take inventory. Sometimes the vessels might have 21 tanks. If you start 8 a.m. in the morning, you finish the process by 4 p.m. in the evening for one vessel. And most of the times, we start by 4 p.m. So, you have an idea of what we're talking about. The fact that the vessel comes doesn't mean you can work on it. You need to wait for tide to come. So, you go to the tidal chart and calculate when the tide will come. That's when the water will suspend the vessel. And then your readings can now be accurate. Are you still with me? I was doing all of that fasting and praying. People were used to seeing my mouth move as I calculate. As long as you separate your secular life from your sacred pursuit, you will be experiencing a spiritual shortfall. That's my response to your question. Yeah, so it is one and the same thing. So when you build it together, you begin to, you even love that you're banking much more. Insight will come. Understanding on how to do it. Oh, we are we are shortchanging ourselves by limiting the measure of help that we can draw from the Holy Ghost because we set our life in that dichotomy. Thank you, Apostle. The next question. Please, sir, explain the term spiritual father. And can a believer have more than one spiritual father? I will rephrase your question. Then I will ask the question again. First of all, I need to show you the difference between a spiritual father and an apostolic father first of all right then i will now define spiritual father First Corinthians chapter four, verse fifteen. First Corinthians chapter four, verse fifteen. This is Apostle Paul speaking. He said, For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet ye have not many fathers. You know we still refer to Benson that also has one of our ancestors. Do you know that there were many preachers in that time? Are you aware? Why do we consider the apostle Benson that was as a significant personality? If you follow the story of Israel, you'll find three significant personalities, and that's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These three men were men that God had transactions with, had dealings with. Are you there? Oh, you're not with me. God had transactions with them, he had dealings with them, had agreements with them, and had covenants with them. On the basis of the covenants that God had with them, God is dealing with their descendants. Do you understand that? So, 
those guys are the ones that are in the category of fathers. Subsequent generations are operating, they are receiving the implication of their transaction. If you see this arrangement here, you will discover that fathers are not many. The fact that the preacher is an old man doesn't make him a father. Maybe he started his 60 years in ministry. And the pattern of ministry that the man manifested is not consistent with the blueprint of God. If you follow him, you, he will become the wisdom by which you will lose your way permanently. Fathers are not many. Number two, I need to tell you that fatherhood is a calling. It is not something you assume after many years. It's a calling. There is a way God is going to structure your heart. It's going to take you through a lot of process. So that through your life, the, the things he has achieved in your life, he can pour it on a generation and use it to bring a generation into something that is in him. That's a deep work. Muslims, Jews, and Christians claim Abraham to be the ancestor. Think of the kind of stature that the man has. So the first mistake that people make is to think that the fact that a preacher is an old preacher, that preacher must be a father. It seems you don't like my talk. All right, let me, let me leave that matter. Let me, <laughs> let me leave the matter. <laughs> you cannot be considered as a father if God personally did not come to you to establish a covenant as to, and then to shape your life in keeping with the covenant to become a platform through which God can step to implement a policy that is upon his heart on a generation. Should I go further? Yes, Many old preachers in Nigeria have nothing to give anybody. Hey. Nothing. The rape that we have experienced in the body of Christ for many years came out of indulgences and excesses. And many destinies were eroded, maligned, shortchanged. That's not fatherhood. Fatherhood is not exploitation. Fatherhood is sacrifice. Fatherhood is not what we can take. It's what we can invest. Many... Are you, are you with me? Let me give you an idea. So many young ministers submit to me. They don't pay tight to me. I don't ask for it. Because in terms of those matters, I believe God will lead you. God might lead you to pay tight somewhere else. Do you understand? So they are not with me because of what I intend to gain. I have not gained. Are you there? But I have duties over them, especially if God reveals that this person coming, protect him. If God gives me an instruction, that's the only way I can enter into that covenant. Because I'm going to suffer because of it. My duty is to ensure that that person is discipled. He knows the value system of the kingdom of heaven. My duty is to be there in significant seasons in the person's life. And also to introduce the person to the body of Christ. And come once and again to increase his influence by the grace of God that is upon my life. There is nothing in that equation that looks like you will gain anything. Most of you sitting here, what has your father gained from, from your life? <laughs> Think about it. I will not enter into that covenant with you casually, except God speaks to me. Then I take on that role. Whether you give me money or you pay tight or you can pay for my air ticket, that is immaterial. Paul says, We don't have many. Others. Should I go further? Those of you that are just newly married, is there a marriage committee in your church? Hmm? Do you realize that in most arenas, the marriage com committee you can, is stronger than demons? That is, you can bind demons. <laughs> but you can't bind that committee. A certain lady wanted to get married from a certain place and then to one of our guys. So we now wrote a letter to the church that these people have marriage intentions. 
Can you advise on the procedure? It is almost two years now. There's no feedback. Now, the question is, that system that was put in place, it is, is it in place to help people or to destroy people? Just think about it. Oh, we have systems that we have put in place like that, that are draconic, demonic, devilish. And that's how our system runs. And you want to find your destiny within that conclave? Think about it. He, he said, not many fathers. You know, my problem is that it's only truth I can speak. That's my problem. I'm not a politician. I tell you the way it is. You can hate me for it. But you see, don't judge me quickly. It might be that I'm in the service of my master in, in doing this, this job that no one will accept to do. The Nigerian church has not grown. The Nigerian church is infantile. We have a firstborn status in Africa to bring perspective. The significant thing about Benzin Idaosa is that he operated our firstborn status. In the days of Idaosa, it was clear that we were firstborn. Yes. And that is part of our ordination in God. He was a replica of a man that fulfilled our ordination. It means that he was in league with the original covenant that establishes us as a people under God. So you, he is a father. His achievements are not in buildings and in hospitals and in estates and housing schemes, but in men. He gave people platforms, gave people opportunity to maximize their potential. When last, when last did those things happen again in the Nigerian church? I'm just trying to give you ideas that we have been lacking fatherhood for a long time. And I can tell you today, just like it was in the days of, of Paul, we have not many fathers. I, I speak in parables. So if I have a son that doesn't live up to the values of the kingdom that I preach and teach, I will release him. Go and look for someone that is like you. Quickly. Yeah. I will try to achieve redemption. I will try to... But when I see that you are bent on being that man that is a departure from the value system of heaven, you will walk alone. It means you are not worthy to be in that fold. And this I do with all seriousness. Because of the errors that have accumulated, people don't even know. The mixture is so powerful that people don't even know right from wrong. It is, it, this kind of situation happens when there are no fathers. Let me stop there. Somebody went for marriage counseling. The feedback got to me yesterday. They canceled. They looked at him and said, you know what they asked? Is that your thing working? That thing? Is it working? <laughs> it's a Pentecostal church. You are, you are not with me. After the, the frown, is the thing working? May the Lord give you understanding. <laughs> Jesus name. Kingdom builders who need to rise again. People that are doing, providing service not because of what they will gain, not because of profit offering, not because of you don't charge anybody. It's not about money. It's about service. And you are going there not because you were invited, but because the Lord sent you. So the Lord will be the one to pay you. I, 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 I ran campus meetings for, for 10 years in Nigeria. I went around Nigeria six times. The campuses that I went to preach could not pay for my tickets for 10 years. So it means that I'm part of the organization because I take care of my transportation. I take care of everything. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Sometimes they give me 20,000. 20,000 can buy one, one leg of my ticket. I did that for 10 years. It was after 10 years, I was somewhere when Jesus appeared to me and said, all right, I'm going to take you to the nations of the world. If you say you are a father, we need to know where you have sacrificed. For how long you have sacrificed? Where are the fruit of your sacrifice in, in the currency of men?
Because a lot of people believe that, oh, the crowd, people, pastors celebrate crowd that gathered. Jesus never acknowledged sitting capacity. He always acknowledged sending capacity. How many people can you send from the people that gather to go in isolation and represent Jesus Christ? It means that discipleship is an old matter. We no longer do that here. What we do is pep talk to help people's emotions for 45 minutes after which we release them for Satan to take over. Yes, I don't want to go on that. The scripture is that we don't have many... I'll leave it there. Yes? Thank you, sir. Um, next question. Buddy, sir, you said in a quote, I think yesterday or the first day, if you pray five hours daily, it will take you seven years to attain power. Yeah. My, my question is, I thought everyone has his own dealings with God. Uh, well, if you don't need the timelines, because the timelines are... are are there to encourage you. If you don't need it, I can remove it. So from now henceforth, you will no longer have an idea of how long it will take. Maybe that will help you. When you have... Yes, now. You don't want a timeline. You think you will pray in tongues today and then God will begin to manifest through your life. If it happens, it is witchcraft. You went somewhere to collect something. <laughs> I think... Now listen... Listen, you might ask, where did I get, where did you get your figures from? That's what you would have asked. There are two sources I got my figures from. First source is Watchman Nee. He said, if you have not labored for 10 years at anything, you don't know that thing. Watchman Nee said that. Second source is Benson Idahosa. He said it in the minister's conference, that if you have not yet labored for 10 years, you don't know what laboring means. So these, my estimates, are not, they are not original to me. It's just a guide. Eh? It's a guide to help you understand that uh, it's a marathon and not a sprint so that your expectations will be guided. But if you don't want it, we, it's, withdrawn. it's hereby withdrawn. <laughs> Labor and get your own story. In the name of Jesus. Yeah, Pastor, go on. Sir, is there anything like generational curse? As we say, we are in Christ. Why are you born again today? What's the basis? The basis of your salvation is not love. The basis of your salvation is justice. For God, God's love was what motivated him to release his son to achieve justice. Are you there? All right. Maybe I'm a principal of the school. Of a school. I love my wife. Then my son attends the school. The school is government school. And part of what you will see on the prospectus is that this is a vase. Anybody that breaks this vase will pay 100000 And for many years, the vase has survived. Gener academic generations. Until my son came and broke it. So my wife now comes to me and says, you know, he's her son. The fact that he's her son does not mean because we love him doesn't mean that the reform will not take place. It is because we love him that we will now pay the sum on his behalf. That's how salvation was acquired. Salvation was acquired by satisfying the claims of divine justice. Salvation is legal. So that is why it is not emotional. It can't change because there is sunshine. Are you there? I say, are you there? Good. The generational cost that you are talking about is a product of a legal premise. That's why I ask, how many of you have been to court? Because there are different kinds of warfare. There are some you fight on the battlefield, which is the one we all know, and there are some you fight in court. And in court, only 20 people can be there, but the sentence of life imprisonment can be given. Only 20 people saw it originally, but somebody is incarcerated forever. You don't solve legal problems but by legal process in salvation. Jesus paid. And in that payment, a new legal premise has been established. Are you there? 
So when you get judgment, which is justification, justification is the verdict of the judge saying you are discharged and acquitted. Exactly. After you have gotten judgment from court, there is something called enforcement. You can get judgment from court and no enforcement takes place. Satan will still sit over your life because there is no enforcement. Exactly. That means in spite of the fact that you have judgment, it is because you have judgment that we can enforce the judgment by faith or by the anointing. So it is possible for, for a generational cause to be there and you have received a verdict through the action of the Lord Jesus Christ, but there is no enforcement. That's number one. Are you still following me? There's no enforcement. That's number one. That is the number one scenario where the transgenerational thing can still hold. Exactly. Number two. How many of you still remember the woman taken with the issue of blood? Uh, no, the woman that was bowed down for 18 years. I think that's uh, is that Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Uh, give me that scripture. Let me show you another matter. Give me that scripture about the woman that was bent over and Jesus came and ministered to the woman. So the first reason why the curse can still be effective is because there's no enforcement. You don't understand your rights, so you could not enforce your new position. And that's why the curse has lingered. Exactly. Now, we have another scenario here. There was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift herself up. And when Jesus saw her, he called, unto, called her to him and said, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. Okay? And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, there are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Are you there? And the, yeah. Now, so Jesus now is justifying his actions of bringing healing to the woman. So he now explains the justification of his actions. Are you? I'd like us to look at it a bit carefully. Then the Lord answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath day lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead them away to watering? The laws of Sabbath does not forbid you from taking your ox to the place where your ox will water. Alright? So in, it's in the same vein, ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham? That's her designation. Her designation is that she's a daughter of Abraham. And guess what? Your designation as a believer is that you are a child of Abraham. That's the same designation you have in New Testament economy. Oh, you didn't get that. The meaning of that is Satan does not have a right to bind you, but Satan can find a reason to bind you. For instance, if you are living a life of sin, <laughs> you have sold out your rights. If you are living in ignorance, you have sold out your rights. If you are not adequately aligned to God and your obedience is not complete, Satan can take dominion over an aspect of your life. So Satan may not have a right, but Satan can find a reason if you are not a disciplined Christian. Jesus said that the woman was a daughter of Abraham, but Satan had bound her low these 18 years. And in this particular scripture, Jesus was functioning as a law enforcement agent. So generational causes, indeed, can find expression in the life of a believer if any of these two positions are satisfied. Next question. My mom died. Okay. When she was sick, 
We prayed and paid much sacrifices so that she would not die. And eventually she died. Okay. What is the Lord teaching me as a believer or teaching us as a believer? Um, there are some things that are superior to prayer. You should have heard this in our teachings now. One of the first things superior to prayer is called the will of God. It is, it is higher than prayer. In fact, prayer is a profitable initiative to the extent to which it is in alignment with what? The will of God. There are some things that are superior to your faith. Faith. Some things are superior to it. One of it is called the will of God. Because the Holy Spirit is not even willing to impart faith into your heart if what you are trusting for is a, in disalignment with his will. Is that clear? And so I can sustain a position that is contrary to the will of God and I claim that I'm exercising faith to make that thing happen. That's not how to pray that kind of prayer. The way to pray it is keep speaking in tongues. Then God will give you an idea of his will. Whenever situ situations are out of hand, don't claim you know how you should pray. Give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to educate you on the matter. Exactly. So I will not go more than that. I know a young preacher. He used to pray for the sick those days. Then he prayed for one and the person died. And he said the Bible is not true. And that was how he backslid. Till this day. He was not told that there are things that are superior to his prayer and to his faith. Yes, Pastor? Please, sir, how do I discover and fulfill my special assignments? Okay, we, we got what, a lot what does he mean by special? Okay, we got a lot of questions around this. Where... Um, now, let me, that word special is making me confused. You know why? Whenever, there's one young man the other time uh, in University of Ibadan, he stopped attending lectures that God has given him a special calling, that nobody has fulfilled that kind of calling before. I knew that it was Satan that was talking to him, but he was not aware. He thought it, he was exciting me by all that rubbish. Satan had done over time on, on him. So that, what is special? What are you doing? What calling are you doing that... That Pyelton did not do. What do you want to do now that Apostle Paul had not done? Are you, are you with me? So remove that special first. Before we answer the question. Remove the special. So that I'll be sure that you are not like that universe of Ibadan. He said, come unto me. All ye that labor. And a heavy ladder. And I will give you rest. That's what Jesus saying. He said, take my yoke upon thee and learn of me. <laughs> you there? Jesus said what? Learn of me. What have you learned of Jesus? What has Jesus taught you? You are talking about special calling. You don't know how this Jesus teaches. You know, I used to watch you people when you do your relationship. I mean, I mean, I can observe. You. Trust me. Then I, I want to see if in what you are doing, you learned something from Jesus. Yes, so I followed you guys for long, and it is obvious. You learn. That's why you are unique. Because you learn something from Jesus. The thing that you learn from Jesus is expressing his originality through your service delivery. You learn. You know the proof that you have learned from Jesus? You are going to be unique, not like a copy. You know there are people now running business churches. Business. They will go to Finland and attend business school. Come here and make it Church pretty. He didn't say learn from Finland. He said learn. Yeah. 
So when you look at my ministry, it is not common. Am I saying the truth? The reason what gives it that texture is because I learned from Jesus. Sometimes the Lord Jesus might direct you and say, okay, look at this man's life. As long as he's the one that directed you, you'll be getting the things he's teaching you through his life. I have learned from Jesus. That is what has shaped our family model. That is what has shaped our ministry life. That's what has shaped our convictions. A thousand preachers can be doing something else and not aware they exist. I'm not aware. I will never accept someone to be a friend that I discover he has values contrary to kingdom values. That relationship has ended. That they, if I find it in the night, that night, I will send you a message. You know why? I need to do something to protect my soul. Satan is planning for me. I need to plan for myself. You are the only one that is not planning now. You can keep 419 friends around and you discover that hey, me that night and I will tell you so that you will not be in confusion. So that if you see me around and I pretend as if I didn't see you, you understand the meaning. We were not supposed to meet now. Hey, you don't choke with relationship when you are talking about ministry. Do you realize that you are spending your life, your lifetime with those people? This is not a dress rehearsal. This is real. And you keep arm robbers and keep deceptive people around? Just learn of me. Learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. Then shall thou find rest for your soul. Instead of you to be proclaiming that you have special callings, why not preoccupy yourself with learning from Jesus? Before Jesus was able to trust me with public ministry, I had 12 years of closet time. 12 years of closet time, of Bible study time. Yes, yeah, studying the Bible. I started that study from the age of 13. Yes. The first challenge I had when I started studying the Bible is the grace to obey it. I saw many things that were contrary to my life. I would be a liar if I started preaching just because I attended theological school because the things were not in my life. Learn of me. Learn of me. For I am meek. I am lowly in heart. And ye shall find what? Rest for your souls. Can we pray in a moment of time? You don't need to stand up if your sitting position is convenient. Let's just take a walk with Jesus. And say, Lord Jesus, I know that I cannot become anything apart from your help, apart from your tutelage. Apart from your illumination, I am willing to learn from you to open up my spirit so that you can guide me. I am willing to learn. I am willing to learn. I am willing to learn from you. I am willing to walk with you. I am willing to align with you, oh God. Someone needs to talk to Jesus right now. Thank you for watching. And if this video has blessed you, please like kindly subscribe and also tap on the notification bell so you can stay notified and updated on our new videos and please do not forget to share the link to people so we can bless more people and most importantly we want to know how this video has blessed you under the comment section don't forget to subscribe